Hi folks, Mr. Teslonian back here again. I want to take you through a project I've been working on for quite a while here. This is a unique gasifying double burner stove. It actually has four burner plates on it that you can use. Uh, let me take you through this up close. I'm kind of in the shot right now. I'm going to move it over. I'm going to kind of demonstrate it from the outside. I'm going to open it up for you and show you how it works on the inside. I'm also going to do a video about how to put a wood stove pipe off of this, how to adapt it on there. And this single burner system here is going to be a good demonstration on how to build a gasifying wood stove uh, for inside your house. That's kind of what this was originally here. It's two different demonstrations all in one. So let me move it over into the shot and I'll, let, I'll show you how it works. So here we are, as you can see from the front shot here. I've got a little grill up here. The grill lifts and then shuts. Uh, you can see on the front here, I've got a little door that came off of a propane heater system, a little glass door so you can see down into the burn box. You can see these levers out here in the front. If I pull this lever out, which I'm going to give you a better demonstration of from above, uh, there's a little tray inside of here that holds what's called biochar. One of the limitations I found with gasification in, in these small gasifiers was that the biochar sooner or later builds up inside the can. The can needs to be dumped out. So there, that was one of the limitations, especially for building a wood stove. Uh, so what I've done here is created a system that dumps from the bottom, dumps it into this tray that I'm moving with this arm here, and that tray pulls out underneath your little grill here with the biochar. So you've got basically a charcoal burn uh, right underneath your little grill. You can refill your gasifier. It'll burn nice and clean again, and you won't get it all locked up with the biochar. Uh, you can push it back up underneath, and it catches that, and I'm going to show you my, my little dump designs and all of that. Yeah, I have another lever here. As you can see, I'm going to have a little wind in this today, so it might be distorted slightly. I have another lever here that does the same thing. There's a little tray underneath inside of here. Uh, this is a separate burner up here. This is a separate gasifier. It's got a separate tray. It's all isolated from the other one. Uh, each one of these systems, as you can see, you can push it in and out and pull the biochar underneath your warmer tray here, or your, your hot pan tray. Now what you see underneath here is the final lever in the front. I'm going to pull that out and show you what it is. It's an ash catch. That ash catch catches every bit of ash or any hot coals that fall through this system. Keeps it down below, allows air draft to get up into the system from the bottom side. So that's where all the air draft basically is created in this system. So when you use this, you get a complete burn unit. You get gasification out of the holes up here in the top, which I'll show you. You get a biochar burn over the grill, and then in the end, your ash all gets caught down here in the lower tray. So we'll push that back in. Let me flip this around so you can see the back. Now, at the back here, you see a couple levers. Back here, some coat hanger wires. Let me show you how that works from the back side. I'm going to open this up, like I said, and show you from the inside. So you unhook the lever, and now you see that arm going up and down. What that's doing underneath there is actuating the bottom of the dump for the gasifier to dump the biochar into that tray down below. So you can actuate the dump, move it up and down so it shakes it all out. And to lock it all the way down, you just move the lever over and it locks in the notch. Same with over here, if I turn that a little bit for you to see. You can tell you unhook it, and that does the same thing on the small biochar uh, gasifier here. So you can move it up and down, dump it into the smaller tray, lock it all the way down. So there you go, that's the back of it. So all this is, truthfully, is this a box that I took from a uh, propane uh, furnace system, a small one, uh, out of an RV. That's the outer case. I've built a bunch of extra stuff, added some legs, and put the trays on there. Obviously, these levers are from other things, even some plumber's tape here. Uh, so I'll show you this a little closer now from the front side and give you a better view on the outside. And then I'm going to stop the camera, open the system up so you can see how it works from the inside. All right, so here we are. We're going to walk around the system here. I'm going to show you how it works and what it looks like. So here's the little grill I was telling you about. You lift the grill up, it holds itself up. Grab the biochar lever here, pull the tray all the way out. You can see it's got burn holes all over in the bottom, burn holes in the sides, so it gives a lot of oxygen to the biochar, allowing it to burn completely. Allow it to burn nice and hot underneath your grill. 
Uh, if you notice here, the back plate of this is higher than the rest of it. When you push that up in there, it lines up right here with the front flashing plate. Right there is in the perfect position to hit the biochar dump lever. It'll all dump nice and safe right in that canister. When it is, you just pull it out underneath your grill. You can keep a pan high, you can roast some food on there, put a little steak on there. Uh, same thing here. As you see down inside of there, you can see the rod going through. If I pull that back, there's a perforated tray underneath there. So you can pull out the biochar underneath your warmer plate here. Uh, so you can set a pan up here, your coffee after it's been cooked, you can set it up above the biochar and keep it warm for a while. So now you just push it in and out. Uh, let me walk you around this and show you the levers. So as you can see here, you just got a hook, you undo it, I'm going to show you that hook from the side. It's just an indent cut inside the metal. You unhook it, it goes through the guide rod and lifts and dumps that lever down below. Now that lever is hooked to the underside plate of that gasifier, this one right here. So as you can see, the burner holes are all right around the top, all the way around. This is an inner and outer. This gap you see here is the air space between the inner and outer burn chambers. So you've got your air space, you've got your burn chamber, same with the larger gasifier. You've got your burn chamber and you've got your air space box around it so air can rush up. You can see inside of there also the perforated holes all the way around the unit. It's where the gasification takes place up here at the top above the wood. You'll see down in there that I have a uh, stainless perforated plate down there. It's suspended above the dump uh, on the bottom. The dump is also slightly suspended away from the bottom to allow air to come in through there. Uh, that, I found that by suspending the screen above the dump plate, it burned much better. So I'm going to show you how that works. Let me unlatch this, and then I'm going to look in there. You pull it down. You pull this up. That goes down. You push it down. It comes up. So you can dump all the biochar right out of the bottom into that lower tray. And all you do is you set your lock again and it's in place. Same with this one here. Try to keep out of the shadow if I can. No, no that's not going to work from that angle. Give me just a second. Alright, so you unlock it using my left hand here. But you watch down in there. It opens up the bottom and shuts it. So you do your biochar dump out of the bottom of the box into the tray below. So now I'm going to show you from the side angle here, I'm going to pop this plate off. It's only pushed on there through little tension resistance points. And I'm going to show you this tray inside of here. You pull it forward, it lines up underneath your, your system here. And maybe if I get up underneath here, I can show you the dump system. So here we go, let me unlock it. You can see that open. So it works really well, it's just a counter rod onto the bottom of the plate. The plate's just got some tabs that were folded up, drilled through to create a hinge, which I'll show you better here in a little while. But there's your biochar dump, let me line up the can for you. You line up, you line up the can underneath the biochar plate, you pull the dump, it lines up right there inside of the char holder and dumps all the biochar. Nice and safe, lock it shut, pull it out underneath. Hi folks, Mr. Teslonian back here again. I'm going to go ahead and fire up the gasifying wood stove for you. First thing we're going to do here is load it with some fine uh, materials that I picked up, some small sticks. You can use this with big wood or small wood. It's just easy for me to pick this up underneath the trees here. So I'm going to show you what I got. This is basically the firewood we're going to use. We're going to just feed that in the hole here. Make sure you don't have any long sticks sticking in there, kind of jamming it all up in a weird angle. Okay, so we got a little bit of firewood put in there. Next thing we're going to do is take some of this cedar bark, just because I want a quick light up here. Just kind of feather it out a bit. There we go. Throw that in there. Let me grab the lighter. Alright, now that we've loaded the stove up with wood, 
I'm going to go ahead and light it up and we'll show you how fast this thing starts up. And that's probably all we're going to need. That cedar bark burns pretty well. Now that we've got it lit, I'm going to let the camera sit there for a minute. Uh, let you see how it starts up. And in a moment here, I'll bring the camera closer and let you see how the burn holes are working. I'll shut the door up and let you see it. Uh, you can see inside of there already we've got a pretty good flame building. Let me stir that up now that we've got it lit. And there we go. So that's the wood stove in action. It's kind of different than typical wood stove or any other fire you've ever lit. Typically you light a fire from the bottom on gasification, at least on this type of gasification, you light it from the top. So as you can see, we've got a good flame going already inside of there. Stove's working well. I've got the dampener on the bottom shut down. I've got the bottom latch all shut up onto the bottom of the burn chamber. And there we go. We've got a good gasifier wood stove already in action here. As this heats up, more of those holes will start igniting more of that fuel in there. Uh, I've got to start creating the air draw up the system. It's got to heat up the stove a bit. So we'll give that a moment. Let me go ahead and zoom in the camera for you here and let you see what it looks like a little closer in. All right, so there you go. This is a zoomed in shot here looking inside the stove. Uh, as you can see, there is an incredible flame going on in there. I was trying to pick a time where I wasn't going to have any wind here creating a draft in through the door, but we're getting it anyways. As you can see, there is a lot of fuel coming out of that stove right now. It's enough to wick out past the door. Uh, what I'm going to do there is go ahead and shut the door down just for a second and show you what it looks like with the door shut. Uh, so give me a moment to set that shot up. Alright, so as you can see, with the door open, there is an awful lot of flame going on inside of there, and the flame will actually come out through the door. The smoke that you see right now is only because I have a loose lid on this thing. I didn't put any of the screws in for the shot. Uh, I just wanted to show you what it looked like. I'm not going to get much closer than this, obviously, because of that large flame rolling out of there. And another one rolling out of the chimney pipe. Uh, that afterburner chimney pipe does a good job making sure that uh, it's almost all like a jet coming out of there right now. Heck of a flame, really tall. That's why I said you, you definitely need a secondary burn chamber with a gasifying wood stove because there's still a lot of fuel coming out of here at the top. And that's also why the syngas production works. You notice here we have an incredible flame also. That's raging out of there uh, quite a few feet. So what I'm going to do here is shut the door down for you after I zoom in and show you what the holes look like inside. I don't know how well this is going to come out. But you can see the lines of fire here roaring through there. And I'm going to back up just a little bit because that wind is actually gusting that out a bit. An immense amount of heat coming out of this right now uh, for the amount of fuel I just put in there. And not only do you get the heat from the syngas production and burn, but afterwards you get a long period of heat that's going to come from the biochar burn. So let me go ahead and uh, shut this door down for you. And show you what it does after that. As you can see I've got uh, more more energy coming out than I really need. So let me go ahead and do that. Oh, Got a little tab stuck off to the side here. Alright so there's the door shut down and now if you notice out of the top it looks like we've got a propane uh, or a uh, natural gas burner going here. Uh, so we've got both a heavy syngas fire going on inside the stove as you can see through the hole in here and we've also got a four foot flame coming out of the top of our chimney pipe and the only reason that's being affected right now is because of the wind but obviously a large amount of syngas production here uh, that's why I realized I could still run a generator off this wood stove even while it was heating my house uh, as you can see, this is a huge flame raging out of there once you shut the door down. Uh, so I've got to figure out another burn box above this wood stove to help disperse this heat into the house also. Uh, that is definitely not what you want to be wasting. 
but it makes you wonder just what's coming out of your stovepipe and how much real fuel is there. An incredible burner. I mean, it almost looks like a turbine engine or a jet engine burning out of the top here. That's about an eight foot flame right now coming out of here. So I thought I'd show you that. That's one of the limitations so far I found that uh, definitely not capturing all the heat in a Syngas wood stove. There's still a lot of energy coming out the pipe uh, that we can burn and use still. So the next stove will be adapted to use this energy which will be heating hot water. Also you can turn it backwards and run your generator in the end. But as you can see that is a very very tall flame. Uh, it's got a lot of energy to it. I'm trying to stay down here below it just in case. So let me go ahead and open up this door again show you what's going on inside the stove. So as you can see we still have immense fire going on inside. That will slow down the jet out of the top slightly when I open that door. You'll see it start to smoke a little bit more. But if you look for that little bit of wood I've put in this stove and the amount of fire that's taken place, it's uh, obviously a better way to make a wood stove than the uh, typical design that we're all used to. Uh, I can basically heat a large building on a very minor amount of wood, especially if I can capture even that fire there. So I'm going to go ahead and back up the camera here and give you a chance to watch it burn for a little while. Yeah, so in the end here, what we have is still more work to do to this system. There's obviously a lot more energy to be captured, uh, more energy than I can capture out of that small burn chamber there. Uh, one of the big keys to recapturing the extra energy within this is this wood stove pipe design. Or uh, in the other video I showed you, it's two pipes, an inner and an outer, with a set of burn holes right about here, and another one up at the top, so it's bringing fresh air up between the two pipes feeding the lower holes and feeding the top ones which has given us a pretty incredible flame out of there. It's starting to die down now. Uh, with the door open it's going to eat that fuel a lot faster than it would if I had the dampener shut. So what I have here is I hope the future of wood stove design incorporated into this with the Syngas production which will be tomorrow's video uh, out of the bottom of this system, I'll put the radiator, the fan, and off with the pipe. And I'll show you the Syngas production tomorrow out of that with the flare off and the lighter. Uh, and I'll show you that this not only can heat your house, uh, very effectively heat your hot water, but it'll also power your generator. And off a very small amount of wood, I'm pretty sure that was enough BTUs worth of energy if I had captured all of this in a building and disperse it as effectively as possible, I could have heated a large building on just a few handfuls of scrap tinder from underneath the tree. Well, until next time, I hope you enjoyed. This is Mr. Tesslonian and the Tesslonian Man Show. Hi folks, Mr. Tesslonian back here again. I want to take you through another gasifier project. This is a takedown model that collapses all the way down so you can put it in a backpack or something like that. I'm going to show you at a distance here how quickly this comes apart and then I'm going to bring you up close and show you how it works. So give me just a second here. First step to take it apart, you're just going to grab the outside, you're going to take it apart just like that. So you have two cases, an inner and an outer. Let me go ahead and show you how quickly this comes apart. You pull one pin right there. Now here's the breakdown sequence for this, is you actually pull it apart and you let it fall. Once you let it fall, you pull it apart, there's one sheet. You let that sheet fall, same thing, and there you go. So now that all breaks down, just like that, into one pile. And the same thing with this one. You're going to go here and you're going to pull this pin right here up out of there. There's also a screen inside of there that you're going to want to just kind of pull out of there. It sits in there when it's all closed up. That can go right inside of there. And the same thing, just start by letting it fold flat. You take one piece out, let it fold flat. Go ahead and take that out. Let it fold flat, and there you go. 
You now have a takedown model gasifier that stacks all together about that thick and it comes with two pins. This is one of three designs that I have now built of a takedown backpackable gasifier. This is the only one that completely collapses like this. Uh, the other two uh, have another ridge that connects and the other one's fully hinged. So what I just wanted to show you here is just how quickly that comes. All right, we got a little wind right now, so we're gonna have some of that in the shot. But now that I've showed you all the long and hard ways to make a collapsible gasifier, let me show you how it works the very easiest. Right now, the rigidity of that square is completely being held together by one piece, and that's this screen. If I take that screen out of there, all you have to do is do that, and the gasifier folds completely flat. There's no need to take it apart. The only removable piece, which I'm actually going to end up hinging into it actually in the end here, so they actually hinge up, the whole thing will fold flat, and there it is. One unit doesn't need anything else. So that's the simplest uh, and the most effective way to create a gasifier that can fold down and be usable anywhere in a very large gasifying unit. Once again, there you go. It's all together. So all you have to do one last time is remove that screen from the inside and bam it goes flat so there's your gasifier folder model this is the simplest way I could come up with building it in the cheapest way I was showing you the progressions as I got to this stage uh, one of the progressions I did enjoy and did like was the one that had the fold over tabs that squared each other off so I think I'll keep something similar to that through it but this will actually be the production model right here. Something that can go into any space nice and flat. There will also be a smaller one that's meant for your backpack. Uh, so there you go. I hope you enjoyed. Until next time, this is Mr. Teslonian and the Teslonian Man Show. Hi folks, Mr. Teslonian back here again. Well, this may not be my uh, most unique invention uh, I've ever made, or most useful invention, let's say, but it may be the most unique. Uh, what you see in front of you is pretty much what I'm assuming, because I can't find any articles about it ever being built before, is a very first in history. It is a wood-powered or wood-fired rifle. Let me say that again. This rifle shoots completely on wood as its propellant. So let me take you through real quick just how this works. Uh, on the outside, before taking it apart, what we have here is we have a gasifier, which I'll open up and show you why it's working. We have an expansion chamber, which is a smoke uh, or fire extinguisher. We have a barrel off the end of it. Uh, here you see a wire coming out for safety reasons when I go to use this. Until I'm actually ready to go like a safety, I take the PZO striker off of that wire. I actually have a mount that it sits into as a trigger. Put that back in the pocket for now. So let me show you what's underneath this. You pull it all the way out here and you can see, maybe you can hear the wind. Let me get quiet and sh let you hear this. That is a high volume, high pressure air pump that I built out of a piece of PVC pipe. Uh, you can see here it's got some really unique guide rod systems going on. Walk it into the shot there a little bit. That's a curtain rod. These are leather seals inside of here. A uh, double guide rod, one inside of a channel, as you can see right here. An inner and outer there that keeps it nice and aligned for the pump. One down below with a shotgun style hand slide. So using this looks a lot like you're pumping a shotgun. Alright, so let me show you just how you produce syngas in this system and then how to shoot it. First thing you're going to do is you're going to extend the receiver, the chamber, away from your gasifier. It's on a channel. You can turn that over. It ain't going to go nowhere. Your gasifier here, the next step is to remove its lid. Just a quick pull off lid here. I'll give you a quick shot down it as close as I can. Uh, it's got a screen in the bottom back here that keeps the material from getting all the way back to the bottom edge. From the pump here, I have a little hole. The actual output from the pump is right here right at the back end, right at the bottom end of the gasifier can, a lot like a bee smoker. 
If you've ever seen how a bee smoker works, very, very similar. In fact, that's what gave me the idea. Uh, I've got some other project I'm working on right now, which you'll be seeing in the next couple days that are based kind of off of that also. So anyways, you take your wood, you pack it in here, get it started, fill it all the way up, take your lid, put it back on, leave your chamber, extend it away from that, and start pumping it. The air pump is what's gonna allow that gasifier to reach over the thousand degrees that's needed so that it'll produce syngas. And once you see the color of the smoke change out of the tip here, you'll know once you start seeing you can hit up the lighter and just sit there and stay lit. Once you see the color change, and here, let me turn this around real quick so you can see what's at the back end here. That is a threaded in piece right there with a hole going all the way into the chamber that lines, as you can see when I slide this all the way back, lines right up, dead connection inside of there. Now that's not how you're going to want to pump it up because you need a little oxygen to make this ignite. I tried that when I first thought you got it started. I was a little disappointed because it wasn't working right. Uh, and then I realized by extending this just a little ways in front of there and by doing a little more or a little less I can vary the amount of oxygen I put inside the expansion chamber with the smoke. So once you got it up into syngas production once again, you'd slide that back, let's say to right there, you give it a couple strokes in there, and you'd slide it all the way back and locks right there. Seals up the back end, creates the block. Once again, you'd have your PZO striker. Goes right onto the end of that wire. And give it a pop and it shoots. So we're gonna go ahead and load this up now. I'm gonna get it started all on. Hi folks, Mr. Teslonian back here again. I want to show you something I've come up with with gasification. I'm not going to show you all of this, but right now I'm going to get it going. I'm going to put a lighter there, and I want you to see something. Notice the nice flame coming out of there. Now if it goes out, you give it a couple pumps here. I didn't really get it going. Give me a second, I'll really get that ripping. Okay. There you go. So I thought I'd show you this. This is a, oh, wanted to go out there. This is a unique design I'm working on right now for a new project. Obviously quite, not quite done yet. It still needs a little bit of work, but I'm producing pretty darn good syngas here. And this is a non-electric model. As you can tell by the sound in the background, I may be running out of wood. Let's get it back pumped nice and hot here. And let's light it. There we go. So there you go. There's something that I've been working on here. A uh, way to make a portable flame, actually. A uh, little more controllable for use off of uh, syngas here, off of wood. Uh, with a little bit of work here, I'm going to have this down to a model that won't go out like that. Uh, so far I have been able to achieve the, the gas off here, which could run other things obviously. You see a pretty good uh, flame coming out of that. I'll go to the end of it. Uh, once again, if I get the power stroke going again, the fire back up. Alright, could be running out of fuel. I've been playing with this for a while. Uh, so there you go. Pretty decent little flame coming out of the end there. Uh, there's all kinds of applications for this. Yeah, I'm running out of fuel, obviously. But you can see there's still quite a bit of syngas if I hold the lighter there. Uh, it burns pretty well. So that's all it's taking right now is just keeping a flame to it to keep it burning. Uh, so a little bit of draw work and I'll have that done. Hi folks, Mr. Teslonian here again. As you can see, I've got a pretty healthy flame being generated here. Uh, it's very difficult to see this flame in the daytime. I'll put it out here in a minute and you can see uh, the smoke actually keeps carrying when there's no flame. Uh, what I've got going on here is an updraft gasifier requiring no fans whatsoever to produce this syngas up here at the top. And all it is is a five gallon oil can Cut out at the bottom, I flipped it upside down there, filled it full of wood, 
and then uh, turned it back around, put that screen underneath there and lit the fire from the bottom side aiming upwards. I uh, threw the pipe up here on top with a can with some holes here to allow oxygen in. And as you can tell here, I'm getting a really nice flame burst. Uh, it's just been sitting there burning for quite a few hours now. Thought I'd share this with you. Uh, just a part of a new project that I'm working on. I'm trying to produce syngas here without the uh, fans and all the extra stuff that most of the other projects I see require. Uh, obviously it's burning really clean there. You don't see much smoke passing by other than what's coming out of the very bottom down in here. Some leak out at the bottom of the system here. But uh, there we go. That's an updraft gasifier. Requires no fans to produce the syngas. It's actually using thermodynamic process to create thermal convection all the way up that system, generating the heat necessary to produce the syngas inside the system. Uh, what I'm going to use this for is a uh, outdoor lantern. Actually, I'm going to have this at the ground height, the uh, bucket full of material. We'll have the tube rising up uh, about seven foot high, and I'm going to have the burner up there at the top, different than this, but uh, also able to do the same thing you're seeing here. And it's going to burn a lot like a lantern uh, off of wood smoke out here. It's going to be a really bright one. Uh, I have to put some mantles in there so that it'll work pretty well. Well, until next time, I hope you enjoyed. This is Mr. Tesslonian and the Tesslonian Man Show. Hi, folks. Mr. Tesslonian back here again. I want to take you through how to make a simple barbecue conversion into a gasifier barbecue. Uh, what you're looking at here is a tray that I built that's recessed down into an old propane barbecue, as you can see here. I just stripped all the propane stuff off of it, took the grill out, everything. And I remade a gasifier inner chamber for it that just comes out. It sits right back in real easy, which I'll show you here in a minute. I just want to explain to you real quick, uh, if you don't know anything about gasification, what we have here is an upper set of pilot holes, basically where the uh, fresh air and some of the mixed smoke is going to mix and burn really efficiently up on the top of the wood mass. And down here on the bottom, we have also the fresh air intakes for the bottom and some of the smoke gets drawn through the venturi that's passing by through the wall, gets drawn through, mixed, and helps with the burn. Uh, so you have a top set of burn holes all the way around. It goes all the way behind here. And you have a bottom set of burn holes every two inches apart, half inch holes, all the way around the entire bottom once again. And three holes I found drilled right here in the center, spaced apart like that, help complete the center burn in the mass since it's such a long tray. and needed just three small holes in there to help complete that burn in the center, whereas the holes going around the bottom and the top on the edges help the edges burn. So there you go, it's a very simple design. Let me go ahead and just pull that out of there if I can with one hand, and you can see it. That's all it is, it's just a tray with an overhanging lip, and that overhanging lip creates a seal between the edge of that and the barbecue edge here on either side. You can see the barbecue came with all the holes I needed already in the bottom. I'm going to put a little sliding door, a dampener basically on either one of those so I can adjust the airflow. Uh, so all you're really going to do is just make this tray, and that tray right there is going to sit right inside of your barbecue. So you'll just have to take whatever barbecue you want to convert, take your measurements and set it down in there. And you notice it sits pretty well. And I'm going to fire this up a little later, take a video of this in action. Uh, I've already used it quite a bit. As you can tell, we, we've cooked quite a bit of steaks and hamburgers on this. I'm going to show you just how long of a burn that you really get out of this thing full. This thing full is way too much material for, say, you know, only five or six hamburgers and stuff like that. If you really want to cook for a lot of people, you can fill this thing up. You only need about halfway up on its height uh, for an average cooking length, and that'll give you all the energy you need. Well, until next time, I hope you enjoyed the Gasifier Barbecue Project. This was Mr. Teslonian and the Teslonian Man Show. Hi folks, Mr. Tesslonian back here again. I want to take you through a project I'm working on for the production of what's called bio crude oil, which is basically another term for a uh, creosote that you produce from syngas production, otherwise known as gasification production. Let me take you through what we've got going on here. The system's not quite done, but right now I'm doing a test uh, of how much gas is going to get produced by the system. That is a sealed can. Let me walk you around and show you what it looks like there. It's got just a single pipe rolling out of the back side of it, so one inch piece of black iron gas pipe. Uh, real quickly here, this will be hooked up right here, this other can, 
right to here. I have a plug in there right now. That's going to be your first heavy creosote collection container. The gas is going to roll down here. And what happens right here is you can tell there's a little bit of gas starting to roll out. With the wind here, it's a little difficult to tell. But there's some gas starting to roll out right there out of the top. And all I have to do is shut this valve when I'm ready. And the gas is going to start working its way through the system much more effective. As this gas starts to cool, it's going to come up to here. It's going to work its way uphill. As it does so, the hydrogen inside of the gas will be the lightest of all the gases traveling uphill and definitely make it over the top. Much of the creosote we built redrip down into the second collection container here. Now the rest of it's going to go up, cross through the pipe here, come down through this, and right now what I'm doing with this can is setting it up to become a, uh, a condenser. I'm going to fill it with cold water. That's going to make a coil inside of it and come out the bottom. Uh, here I just wanted to see what kind of gas I'm producing. Alright folks, here we are back again. Uh, this is going to be the bio crude oil production system here. I'm going to take you through right now. We've got it heated up. You can see a heat shield I just threw on there. It was kind of hot, so it's not going to be too straight. Uh, but this is going to be producing what's called bio crude oil. I'm going to take you through here and just show you that our syngas production is doing pretty well. So here's the smoke coming out of the end of the whole system right here. Let's hit that with a lighter. If I can get the lighter to light. There we go. And as you can tell, it's a good burning gas there, nice and clean. Uh, direct composition of a basically hydrogen, methane, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, and a little bit of nitrogen. Hi folks, Mr. Tesalonian back here again. I finally got the bio crude system fully completed. And what I'm going to do today is go ahead and explain a little bit of what I've done here to complete the system. And also show you it in action and at the end of the day show you some of the crude oil we've collected. Uh, later on I'll show you how to refine this crude oil into fuel that you can use in any engine. So let's go ahead and go through this process. I've already explained uh, the big pipe in the background in the first two videos and the, the first collection jugs here, which I'll come in and show you. I've already tried to explain these a little bit. This is a downhill pipe that's going to go anti uh, the direction of natural thermodynamic processes. That'll help condense out or precipitate out some of the oils at a much faster rate than it would be if that pipe was going the natural uh, thermodynamic flow direction. So anyways, we have our first catch here. This is going to be the heaviest and thickest of the crude oil, uh, this can here. And you notice I have a spout coming out the bottom here into this one liter bottle. Uh, what that is is allows me to pull that off and do a check on this oil as it's running and the system's moving here. Gives me also an indicator that we're starting to fill up. So anyways, let me go through here and show you the rest of it. It goes down that pipe from a reduction point here. Uh, into another T. This is our secondary catch like I explained on the first videos. Comes up the hill here with the lighter gases not yet condensed. Rises across, loses a lot of energy and now is once again restricted into a quarter inch copper gas pipe. That runs down here and as you can see here that's full of water. Uh, that's nice cold water. It's got a little bit of pine needles. It came from the pond so it's nice and cold here. I've got a nice 20 loop condenser coil inside of this five gallon tank. Uh, running out the bottom of it, you see the pipe running out here into the top of this one gallon uh, pickle jar here. And so you can see that it just comes into the top of the jar. The next pipe comes out of the top of the jar. We're not actually trying to put it down too far because you don't want it bubbling once it starts to fill with crude oil. Uh, you just want it grabbing the lightest of the gases, the hydrogens and the nitrogens, the carbon monoxides and others uh, that are still left within this system. You want to grab, grab that right off the top. Now it comes up this pipe here, goes through the T, and once again we have a secondary condenser uh, that this goes through. Now it's about four or five loops going through there. Comes out through there, and that's where the liquid's going to condense from this condenser. That's where it's going to be caught. This is a five gallon plastic jug here, a uh, Culligan jug. Uh, the smoke's been cooled quite a bit by the time it gets here, so I can start incorporating a little bit more plastic in the system. The liquid will be flowing, dropping the jug, and the lighter smoke will continue on now down the pipe. And I'm actually going to show a couple shots of this running a generator and running a uh, propane-powered refrigeration system. That way you can see that when your wood stove over here in the background is running, keeping your house warm, you can have the reactor up top now fueling uh, crude oil for your car. It's also heating your hot water, by the way, in your wood stove. The crude oil production, they can refine that crude oil into gasoline directly back through the stove. And out the pipe here at the end, you have uh, both your 
propane powered refrigeration system and your generator running. All off of just one wood stove and a tank of fuel above it. All from organic materials here. So give me a moment to set up the camera here and I'm going to show you what we've got going. I'm going to light the reactor which you see right here. Uh, the reactor is very simple. It's just two pieces of can. I'll pull the top off. You can see it's full of wood here. Back to the top. And all it is is a cut off piece of can here, the bottom of a can, and I cut the top off the other one here. And they seal over each other quite a ways and create a really nice pressure sealed chamber reactor. So give me just a moment and I'll show you how to put this all together, light it up, and we're going to watch crude oil in production. Alright, now we've got syngas production. Uh, it's very difficult to see the flame burning out of the hose there. So what I'm going to do is take a piece of newspaper here. I'm going to hold it up over that so you can see there's actually a flame burning there. I'll put that back out and show you again. The flame is almost dead clear and impossible to see. You can see it lights it right back up. Uh, that's because that flame is basically a pure hydrogen flame. I'll put it out real quick here and show you the smoke coming out of there. So there you go. You can actually kind of see the the color of the smoke, but you notice it's very clean. Now I'll light that again here for you and show you just what it does. Now you didn't even see it light. I'll take that piece of paper there, hold it over it, and once again the piece of paper is on fire. So we've got really clean synthetic gla uh, gas being produced here at the end there. So there you go. You can see just the volume of gas being produced when it's not on fire. How it's rolling out of there. Once again, and these lighters are tricky. There we go. That's the difference when it's lit. It's a very long flame. So one of the next videos I'll be showing is how to run a generator and how to use your propane powered refrigeration system off of that gas. So let me go ahead and put it out. You can see it bit burning here against the, the background. Even with the wind, it's not putting it out. It's a healthy flame. All right, there we go. Let's go ahead and run that tube out a little bit just in case there's any moisture gaining inside of it. All right, so here we go. We're gonna go back over real quickly here. You can see I've got a pressure leak a little bit right there and it's blowing some oil. I'm gonna have to fix that, obviously. Definitely getting oil in that container. Uh, if we come over here, look inside the jug now, it's about uh, just a few minutes after the last time I showed you, and there's quite a bit of oil in there. If we look up in here and see if we can see the drips again, uh, which I don't know if we're going to be able to, it's pretty thick in there. Yes, you can still see it just for a moment there through that cloud. Uh, it's still dripping quite nice. Obviously a very high grade oil we have here. Look at the color of that. Uh, very auburn colored or like a honey oil in a way. So that's hopefully going to be our highest grade of uh, refinable fuels out of this. Let's go ahead and take a look now into the fourth one and see if now we're getting... Well, I can see smoke in, coming into the system here. I don't actually see any drippage going in, but if the smoke's going in, actually here on the walls, uh, you can see some condensation. It's very, very clear looking. Uh, almost no color to it anywhere in there. And in fact, uh, there is some building in the bottom. It's going to be difficult now, maybe after running it for the day, it'll build it up enough to show you and then we'll dump it out and I'll show you the, the color that we're actually achieving. This is very clear. Uh, I'm not really sure if this is pure moisture or if it's going to be a high grade of, uh, of an oil of some kind. Let's, we'll find out here in not too long after today's run. Alright, we're looking at the first jug here. Uh, this is what was collected out of the second container, the second condenser jug. Five gallon can uh, at the very bottom of the downhill slope of the first extended pipe. Uh, you can see here if I rock that, it's got a nice oily look to it. It's a little more liquid than the first catch. Uh, a little thinner, but it's very, very black, very nice. Uh, and if we look at it right here on the side, you can see just about how much we got out of that. And let's see, that is about a quarter of a gallon uh, right there. So let's go ahead and go on to this one. Now this is the glass jug that we had been looking at the whole time. And as you can see, 
if I move that around, there's a nice black layer on the bottom and this really golden honey colored oil floating around up above that. And you notice if that black stuff and the honey color weren't both oils, the black would be on top. Typical if that was water and oil. So that was how much we collected, minus a little bit of experimenting from there, obviously. And then this is from the first one. This is a very thick crude oil. You can tell because I can put it up on the edge of the glass there, pull it back. You can see a lot of it left over behind on the glass. Uh, still a little bit of water in there that we're going to condense out of this now that we're going to put this through the refinery. So if you look at that jar, we ended up with... Not too bad, uh, a little bit there, what is that jar, about a one quart, maybe a quart and a half jar, so I'm not sure, maybe a half a quart to a quart of uh, really thick crude there out of that one. So if we made a total measurement here between the three, we probably ended up with just under a half a gallon of crude oil, minus also what I have here. So let me go ahead and pull these test tubes up one by one here and show you the consistency and the color up close. So you can see from the fourth and final collector here, it's a very thin colored, almost rusty uh, looking liquid, very thin, very viscous, not much consistency to it. Let's go ahead and grab the second container here. You'll notice a really beautiful golden color to that fuel. Uh, it's about the last of where the oils really collect, a higher grade of oil. All right, you can notice how thin it is. It doesn't stick up on the glass all that well. Let's go to the second catch here. This is where we start getting into a little bit darker crude. And you'll notice in there, if I move that around, it will actually color the glass, but won't fully stay on it. Uh, that's pretty good indicator to the quality of fuel you get there. Very liquid. All right, and fourth and final one here. Uh, as you can tell, if I roll that onto the glass, say towards us here, it'll actually stay and coat the glass. Uh, as you can tell right there by the streak running down it. Uh, that's a very thick crude. You can tell when I try to roll it there, it doesn't roll like the rest. It's a very slow moving crude oil. So that's what we're collecting in the very first collector, and as you can tell, it'll sit up there on the glass. We got some uh, evaporation bubbles in between it there, but I can show you from this side. Very dark crude oil. So the next step of this project now is to put this all through the refinery, which will actually be connected inside the wood stove that made all of this. So in the end, what we'll have is all the liquid being produced, the crude oil, will once again flow back through the wood stove, go through the refinery, out the refinery tower, and on the other side we'll have a high grade fuel to use in any engine. I hope you enjoyed. Until next time, this was Mr. Teslonian and the Teslonian Man Show. Alright, now that we've uh, let the fire die down, I'm going to go ahead and remove the camera here. I wanted to show you something that I was talking about. Uh, we still got some nice red coals burning inside of there, you can see flashing. So I'm going to keep the camera out from over that. But I was going to tell you, you know, as I was saying throughout the shot, there's condensation or a moisture building still at the top of the test tube. And I'm not sure why it's building so thick and then running back down without ever leaving the system. I may have some restriction in here that I'm going to have to take a look at. But we did end up with some fuel out the other side here. So let's take a better look at this fuel. And you can see it, let's see here, you see a little bit of it rocking around down in the very bottom down there. Uh, we're going to try to light this on fire real quickly here. Let's go ahead and set the camera down and see how well this lights on fire. Okay, so here we go. Alright, um, so what I've got here is I've got a lighter and a few sticks. Uh, I don't know, we got a couple pieces of wood and some sticks here. We got a lighter. Alright, so let's go ahead and see just how flammable, if at all, our fuel. Let me go ahead and give you a shot there, if I can, inside the jar. Showing you there's some sediment in there. Then Now that could have come out of the pipe. It actually has an oil appearance to it. I was just looking at it. 
kind of a darker color, still kind of amber colored uh, on the fuel here. So we're going to take a longer stick, rub it around inside of that, try to get it covered, and see if this will burn at all. So here we go. There we go. Wow, look at that. It burned immediately and is almost gone. So there you go, that was the flash burn of our fuel. If it burned that fast, I'm actually expecting this to evaporate very quickly. Uh, let's try that again. All right, you can see the moisture all over the stick here. We can get the lighter to light. There we go. And it's burned off. Okay, so I don't want the stick to burn here. Try that again. This seems to be a pretty good grade of fuel. It doesn't have a lot of length to its burn, but it's got a good flash, which means it's probably more of a gasoline. Look at that. Isn't that amazing? So, there you go. That's how to refine uh, from wood all the way to gasoline or some form of high grade fuel here. I'm going to keep playing around with this just for a moment, just to show you. Uh, hopefully, this will continue to burn the whole way. Yeah, look at that. That's just great. Uh, look how fast it burns away though. That, that's really impressive. Leaves almost no residue behind as it's doing so. It's almost burning more as an alcohol than it is uh, of a gasoline. I'm going to have to try this next to uh, normal gasoline and see what the difference is going to be. It's got a little bit of an oil smoke to it when it burns. Pretty neat. I'm going to save this little bit now, and I'm going to try to do a couple more experiments with it just to see exactly what it is. Uh, our next process, let me go ahead and put this back together so it doesn't evaporate all out of there. Alright, now did we get any fuel inside the second jar? Hold on, before I go on. I don't really, let's see if we got any light whatsoever. Um, it's a curious fuel. It drew the flame in for a moment instead of blowing the flame out. Uh, so I, I'm pretty sure alcohol and gasoline burn differently, and I'm going to have to look up again which one burns which direction. Uh, that'll give me a pretty good idea. That actually pulled the flame inwards instead of blowing the flame outwards. So there you go. I hope you enjoyed uh, how to make gasoline or some form of fuel to run an engine. Uh, off of wood from the beginning by turning it into bio crude oil then distilling it like we have here today and turning it into gasoline. Our next project is going to be taking this grade right here, this honey oil, and now running this through the system and seeing what kind of fuel we can turn this into. Well, I hope you enjoyed. Until next time, this is Mr. Teslonian and the Teslonian Man Show. Hi, folks. What we got going on here is synthetic gas production. I've taken the carburetor off of the generator. No more fuel line or anything. What we're going to do is stick that down inside of there. See if it won't start up for a while. Well, you can hear it firing up a little bit. Okay, what this might be is now I gotta adjust this air fuel mixture here to the point where it's just right. Okay, it doesn't like that as much as it did because the first one. Well, you can see, I'm almost there. It's just getting that air fuel ratio just right. Another thing I may be doing is that the gas production may not be at high enough rate to keep the engine running. We're going to try it out a few more times.
And there we go. That is the generator running completely on synthetic gas. I've been at this for a little while this morning to get it right. I had it running like this a little bit ago. I knew I could get it again. So there you go. That right now is pure synthetic gas. And you can tell as this generator gets going, it's starting to run a little bit stronger. I'm slowly moving my finger with a little air gap around the hose I just stuck down in there in my finger. And I'm using my finger right now as a kind of a valve to allow more oxygen in. You can tell I can shut it down a bit if I seal it off. That's electricity. One more step to turn in the wood stove here into the ultimate energy independent system ever built. And right now, that's a generator creating electricity. That's a 4,000 watt uh, industrial grade generator. So obviously it can run a smaller system a lot better. That's exciting. That's really exciting to know that right now, that's free energy. I don't have to pay the gas company. I don't have to pay anybody for this. You know, it's uh, some wood off my own property. And right now, that could be power in my house. So I'm gonna go ahead and sit here and let this run. I've gotta put some more wood in the wood stove to allow the temperature to stay hot enough for my syngas production. I'm getting my airflow mixture a little bit better here. You can tell the generator's running a little better. Now that's awesome, is it not? And just to show you here, Let's kill the generator and we'll pull the hose out. We'll show you that that's what's running it. There you go. You can tell it's going to take just a second for that synthetic gas to start coming back out of the hose. To me, that's awesome. That's one step closer to having a fully independent system that runs on wood. Let's see if we can get it to start back up again. Look at that! Alright, so now I'm going to make some adjustments. I'm going to finish the mounts. I'm going to make an adjustable airflow, obviously. And I'll be able to, when this wood stove system is fully designed and built, the wood stove will be in my house. This will be outside, running, powering my home, anytime the wood stove's up and running. I thought you'd enjoy this as another step in the bio crude oil super efficiency wood stove design system. You can tell I'm a little dirty. I've been working on this all morning, but most science is a little dirty. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and pull the hose again. That is incredible. Uh, just to show you if I got one on me here. How flammable that synthetic gas really is. There you go. It's right on fire right there. It's an invisible gas uh, flame. I mean, that flame's almost dead clear. Very clean fuel we're producing. We'll put that out again. One more time, see if we can fire this thing up. One pull. You can't beat that. I don't have that. Any gasoline. Nothing. I can pull it one time and it fires up my generator. So just a little bit of work. I'll turn the camera back on when the refrigerator... Hold on. I'll turn the camera back on and take another film when I've hooked the refrigeration system and everything else into this. You'll have the crude oil refinery coming through the wood stove and that'll be producing butane and propane just about like this, like you saw in the refinery film. 
that flame is going to run the refrigeration unit. So that will run off into your propane powered refrigerator. That smoke is going to run your generator. The wood stove will heat your house and your hot water and produce crude oil, refine it into gasoline for your car. Until next time, I hope you enjoyed. This was Mr. Tesalonian and the Tesalonian Man Show. On your way out here, we'll just fire it up and let you go out with that. Oh. There we go. Hope you have a great day. Hi folks, Mr. Teslonian back here again. I'm going to take you from the ground up, step by step, how to take what you see in front of you basically. Other than that shiny pipe sitting there at the angle, well, I have 40 feet of that, not just a little section. Uh, I just didn't want to put that up there on the truck. Uh, we're going to take basically what you see here in front of you and we're going to make this little truck right here, Chevy Love, run on synthetic gas from wood. Uh, we're also going to precipitate out all of our liquids, uh, the crude oil, the bio crude, and our methanol producing products out of that smoke in the process and hopefully run that around our exhaust in the end, converting that over to another usable fuel and putting it into our engine. Uh, so let me go through real quick what we're going to have done here with what you see in front of you. Uh, like I said, the shiny pipe here at the angle, it's not just one little section. We need 40 feet of that actually for my truck here. Uh, that's going to help us create the radiator system as well as these three nice chunks of one inch black iron pipe you see threaded on both sides. Uh, those are all seven foot long right there. So that's going to give us uh, all together what 21 so 61 feet of piping between the two inch and the one inch uh, for our radiator system. And I can't imagine that that's not going to get our smoke from the synthetic gas production reactor here down below the uh, dew point. So I don't think we'll need much more than that. Anyways, so you got the one big tall tank here as you can tell. That big tank is our material tube. And so we're going to just cut a top, uh, a blow by pressure relief top with a big spring in this. Uh, we're also going to cut the bottom of that tank and we're going to attach this tank cut off right here right to the bottom of it because this tank's smaller than that one what this will do is that has a reduction point and that's actually where the paralysis is going to take place is right there uh, our pyrolysis process is going to actually take all that charcoal and then at the bottom of this tank instead of leaving it the same size I'm actually going to go underneath a little bit and make that slightly reduce more probably about an inch of reduction from the actual diameter of what you see uh, and that'll actually help us even reduce that charcoal, compact it just a little more before it has to go through. The smoke actually has to force itself through more of that charcoal, which will help convert more of it into an appropriate syngas that we need. A cleaner syngas, hopefully with less tar production. Uh, so basically that's where we're starting here. And the whole unit, that tank welded onto the bottom of that one, once it's done, will sit inside of one of our barrels here. Uh, about halfway down the bottom of the reactor, which will be this tank, will sit down about halfway into this barrel. And what that's going to do for us is give us a dead air space that the heat can travel around and that'll have this in the center of it, preheating our material inside of it. Preheating this and keeping this nice and warm, especially driving down the road, taking a lot of our thermal energy off as the wind passes by. So it'll be insulation in parts of this uh, and also air channels in parts of this so that the smoke can get to the top and get back out to the rest of our system. All right, and so you see the second barrel here. Uh, and the second barrel is going to be for our hay filter system at the very end of everything. Right before it goes out and into the carburetor, uh, that's going to be completely packed full of straw. That'll help uh, the final drying process after we've run it through all the condensers and radiators. Which I'll also have, like you see over in the other project right here in the background, those condenser jugs like that, I'll have a few of those sitting at the bottom peaks of the radiator system running above this bed. Now the radiator system is actually going to be bolted down right to here across the top of the bed line here all the way down on both sides. It'll sit as high as the cab slightly pitched in. It'll be a big two inch pipe radiator system running across on both sides. That'll help to make sure that a lot of our gas is well below the dew point and precipitate its moisture out of it. That's plenty of radiator and if not what I've done here with the black pipe is I'm going to cut that up and make my new tailgate uh, a radiator tailgate out of it if that's necessary. So let me get this started by cutting this tank and once I get this tank cut I'll show you about taking the measurements 
for this tank here, welding the two together and getting our reactor and our material tube put together here and then into our barrel. All right, folks, uh, just going to take you through real quick where we are on the tank project. Uh, this is gasifier conversion. So here, let me show you something real quick on cutting your propane tanks. First of all, if you smell gas in them, or even if you don't smell gas in a propane tank, you should fill that tank all the way to the top full of water. And make sure while you're cutting it that you're cutting in a water line the entire time. Do not allow a, a large amount of open air space in them. But if you notice here, this is the weld line from the top of the tank there. This is the weld line. I went right below it and cut around and I still had one more chunk of strengthening steel they put right behind the weld line to cut through. So if you go about a half inch below the edge of the weld line and make your cut, you won't have to cut through two pieces of steel like I did here. Hopefully saving you uh, quite a bit of your bits and some of your time. So what we've done now, is, since we've got the top of that cut off, we've centered it and set it on our larger tank here. That's going to be our volume tank for our mass and our wood there, the larger gray one. This one's our reduction zone, our first of the reduction zones here. So we're now going to mark that out and cut out the gray tank so it's the same size going into this. Weld these two together and we're going to take up here, take a three inch hole saw. I'm going to make a three way mark here and try to leave about a half inch gap all the way around, small amount of material in the center and take three holes out with a two inch hole saw and leave a kind of a pre-screen area here with two inch holes in it that'll help to make sure that the material is not dropping into my screen below the ash screen too quickly. So let me go ahead and get that done and I'll show you from there. Alright, like I said, I flipped the reactor now over. I've taken that top piece back off. I just want to really quickly go over something here with you on the design. If you notice right at the tip of my finger right here, there's this black line carved in here right there going all the way around. That's the actual true dimensions of our uh, reduction zone here. So what I'm actually going to have is a slight reduction from the tank even from what the actual size of the reduction zone is. And what that will allow me is a small air gap right here and a downspout area that's going to allow for where my, our air inputs are going to be right here to constantly keep clean. The majority of the time if we have a little bit of an overlap here there's a little chance that something's going to come in and go back upwards and stay there anyways. Uh, it may get in there originally but it won't stay there so it's going to make sure our air flow is a lot more reliable with a small amount of overlap. So let me go ahead and keep going. Alright, well, let me show you what my exhaust is looking like. I can see it in the rear view that um, I've got some smoky looking exhaust. Well, it could be dust. You'll see this trail behind me. Let me go ahead and flip around. I'm going to help out real quick and take a look at what's coming out the tailpipe. Maybe I need to get my mixture a little bit leaner or, or a little bit thicker. Alright, notice no smoke coming out of the thing. Looks like it's doing pretty good. Um, let's look. Actually, I see a little bit, but it's nothing like what I expected. It's actually burning pretty clean. Uh, so there you go, there's a great test. All right. Well, you can tell there's a uh, a bit of a leak here in my bio crude container. Yeah, I can see it right there. We've got leaky crude oil down here in the bottom. You can see it pooling up right down underneath right there. So I'm gonna have to look for that. But we're obviously producing a good amount of bio crude. Uh, oh, that thing's hot as can be. So let's go ahead and open this other one up. I've got a cap, we've been running on two, and I've been wondering if that's not the problem here for getting it going a little bit stronger. So we're gonna open up all four. We're gonna now try to run this on all four of those wide open. All right, so here we go. That made all the difference in the world, folks. All right, I was starving for fuel. It looks like I got plenty of airflow. I'm just, oh, the idle's way higher, though. Well, that's something I'm gonna have to adjust there, folks. 
It's uh, making my idle rev extremely high. I don't know if you can hear that in the background, but that's not normal for the truck. Um, so let me go ahead once again here. We're going to turn around. We're just testing this thing back and forth between the place and the gate. The exhaust smells different. Uh, it's, uh, it's a little different than I'm used to. Man, we're doing pretty good here, folks. There we go. We're once again uh, cruising on this. What we're going to do is we're going to go up do another lap here, if you'll stay with me. And then, uh, let's see. Okay. All right, it's working great. Those four open when you need the power, when you need the extra fuel, seems to be the way to go. That does match though, since the rest of it is two inch pipe and those four pipes equal two inches. So it's a matching airflow amount. All right, let's go down one more time here. We're gonna shut it off and I'm gonna show you live from this that we're actually still running on Syngas. Uh, that there's a... Uh, that's what's actually doing this. I'm kind of worried about shutting it down, but we're going to see if we get any back blasts here. It'll be a good test on the, the puff backs through the, the reactor. Um, so, uh, you can tell this is working great. I haven't had to make any real adjustments once I kind of got it going. I had to bend that just a little bit. <clears throat> yeah, so it's, you know, that's, that's all that I've had to do. So here we go. All right. All right, so let's put it in neutral here. All right, let's walk around real quick. <laughs> All right, folks, that's awesome. That's, that's a truck right now running on the power of wood. And it's running great. Uh, our filters are obviously working pretty well. We're going to do a test here in a moment and see just how well they're working. Folks, what I'm going to do now is go ahead and let's go in and shut down this truck for you. There you go. Now let's watch this reactor. There should be some kind of smoke starting to come out of our reactor now that there's nothing going on. Oh, there you go. It's coming out of the pipes. So there we go, folks. I don't know how long it's good to keep that running without pulling through it. Um... I can hear liquids bubbling in there. Let's see if it'll start. All right. Here we go. Oh, that's nice. Well, you're going to catch that because I'm not going to edit it. <laughs> there we go. Hey, like I said, the idle's extremely high. Here we go. Let's go back out. All right. You can see this cloud of smoke still actually kind of puffing away there. There we are, folks. No smoke coming out of the pipes or out of the top of reactor now. I don't have the aluminum full of water, and it's it's not it's not hot, but it's it's getting warmer. It's lukewarm right now, so having that water would sure help. I don't see anything coming out anywhere. I haven't seen any leaks. And here's the greatest thing: is let me lift up my hood. And there we go, folks. That's running on synthetic gas. It's a higher idle than it normally runs on, so obviously the hydrogen content has uh, got a higher RPM than the uh, gasoline. So once again, we're, we're running through everything. Oh, that's cool to the touch. Hey, these are actually nice and cool to the touch. So there's no heat even getting this far. Yep. So we're doing good. We've been running for a little bit here. Let's see how long we can keep this going. Um, no, I don't want to break that seal yet. Everything seems to be working pretty well. Let's not mess with it. I had to open this valve up quite a bit and stick a, a blade in there, kind of a, a swirling blade. It, it's actually half closed. I'll show you what I did here in the other film. But it needed a lot more airflow than I thought it was going to need. But there it is, folks. 
Once again, let's go ahead and just reach in. And then we can see here, let's give it a second and see whether immediately, look at that, boom, that smoke's coming back out. Now that's highly flammable gases really, and it's probably not safe to be doing this uh, without using up all the fuel. So I'm gonna go ahead and you can see a, a bunch rolling out over the lip there at the top. Coming out of there everywhere again. Let's go ahead and start it up uh, from right here. Let's see how it does. <laughs> all right, that's great. That means all the work was worth it, folks. That, that means that from now on, I get to drive to town anywhere I wanna go. I'm still gonna do a highway test, obviously, on this, but I'm gonna give it a longevity test out here on the ranch for the next couple days and just make sure there's nothing about it that I don't like. Uh, make sure it's running nice and strong. But there it is, folks. There's our system working. That was so worth it in the end. Once again for you, let me reach in, turn this thing off, and we'll see if the smoke comes back out of the top right here. Let's see how long that takes. Can we see the other pipe over there? And already there it is. So there's our smoke coming back out. Our reactor's definitely burning really well. I was starving for fuel though with, uh, with only one of these open and then I went to two and then in the end I ended up opening all four of those pipes wide open. Uh, I wanted to just see, starting at one, see what we could do. Uh, so there you go, let's start it back up if it's gonna do it for us. <laughs> oh, that's great. And there goes the smoke right back through our system. So there you go, folks. There's how, from top to bottom, how to make a gasifier truck. From our radiator system, which even this pipe is surprisingly cool. Um, so there you go. I hope you enjoyed. Until next time, where we'll do a highway test with our gasifier truck, this was Mr. Teslonian and the Teslonian Man Show. Hi folks, Mr. Teslonian back here again. What we're gonna do today is we're gonna take this water pressure tank. So this is a high pressure air tank for a water line, and that's 55 gallon barrel. We're gonna use two of these 55 gallon barrels in this water pressure tank. We're gonna turn this into a really large gasifying wood stove for the shop that I'm in right now. So what I've done here is kind of set this all up so I could show you really quickly how we're gonna do this. I don't want this video to take all that long. You can see a triangular mark here all the way across and I've already begun my cut across there. This will actually be the bottom of our inner burn chamber. So this will sit inside of our barrel here. I've already got the bottom of that cut out. I'll flip it over here in a minute and show you that. But I want to kind of go through. So this will be the bottom of it. This will be our ash dump. I'm just about done cutting that out. I wanted to show you that here like this and we'll put the hinge for that off of here. Uh, down here at the bottom. I'm gonna cut all the way across where you see that bottom line there, not the one with the marks on it here, but this bottom line. I'm gonna cut all the way across and remove a section of this air pressure tank. It's a little too long for what I wanna do. It won't leave any ash catch room in the bottom of the barrel. These lines that you see, so I got one here, and go up to top of, and I've got one right here. So this is actually where we're gonna drill all the holes all the way around to allow the airflow into our inner burn chamber, which is the pressure tank here. Uh, so these are marked, every one of them, both top and bottom, at one inch all the way around. These are going to be pretty large holes, and I'm not sure yet. I'm going to start small, work my way up, and see just how the airflow works, and see how well this is going to work with a, let's say, a 5 8 inch hole right here. And we're going to probably go about a 3 8 inch hole up here. That's what I'm picturing so far. Now, these may change as I see the burn ratio and how it happens. I may have to go slightly larger up here, where we go maybe even to a uh, half inch hole, and I might be able to get this up to a three quarter inch hole down here at the bottom. I don't think we're gonna need to go that big. I have a feeling that a five ace and a three ace hole ought to do just fine for this. So let me go ahead now. We're gonna cut that bottom section off like I said. I'm gonna drill all my holes in here. I'm gonna go ahead and finish cutting this diamond or a triangular plate out of the bottom of this for our ash dump. I'll flip the barrel over and show you the hole we've got in there. Let me just go ahead and take the lid off of that, set that down for a minute. 
All right, so you can see if I flip it up, I've already cut a hole in the bottom of this barrel. And there you go. So that hole is set up exactly the perfect size for our air pressure tank here to rest all the way down and marry right up to this expanded edge off of the barrel that I've cut in. And then we'll weld that together. And that'll give our outer air case, our inner burn chamber. We'll have our holes in the air pressure tank for that. We'll have an area at the bottom. And I, you notice I didn't cut out the spot where the lid was because I want to be able to open the lid and dump the ash out of the bottom of the entire barrel. So it's a really easy full dump at the bottom of this. Uh, so let me go ahead now, finish drilling the holes, cut some of the pieces there, and I'll show you what it looks like from there. Here's what we've got done now. Like I showed you in the previous video, we needed to cut a bottom section off of this. So here's the bottom I cut off of that air pressure tank. And now we've got this system. We've got it turned upside down. Now you can see I've got my three eighths inch holes drilled all the way around. Here at the bottom end of it, it's flipped upside down. We have our five eighths inch holes, one inch apart, drilled all the way around. I've cut the bottom in here and built a hinge. So we now have a dump door and I wanted to just show you that. So now it opens up and that'll dump the ash out of the bottom of the system. And it's got an arm right here that we're gonna attach to that'll go through the outer barrel. So what we've gotta do now is take this, flip it upside down and stick it down inside of this cutout section of the barrel here and weld it to the rim. And then we're gonna put some legs underneath this and fire it up. What you see on top here is an afterburner chimney pipe that I designed. You can see it in the previous wood gas videos uh, for the wood stove design that I have there. And all that is is built for the show so I can demonstrate outside just how much fire extra, even though we've incorporated all of this barrel system is full of fire, the wood gas being produced is enough to still put a big giant flame out the top of this. So what we're gonna do to finish this system, and I'll show that in a later video, is we're gonna run with some 90s out of the top of this stove, all the way down to two more barrels stacked on top of each other, identical what you see right here. At the bottom of that, we're gonna put the wood gas from this stove up into that, and then we're gonna mix cold and fresh air in there in different spots all the way up it. So we'll have a column of fire uh, right beside this in two barrels created by this system. And I built this afterburner stove pipe just to demonstrate how big that fire really can be. So I'll show you that here tonight when we fire it Let me up. Let go ahead now, flip the camera around, kind of walk you through exactly what I've done to build this. So right here, you see the door. Uh, I was able to create a nice seal with two sets of these quarter inch flanges. You can see right here, if I come in close, you can see this nice quarter inch flange. I even put another eighth inch piece of solid plate. The sooting line was perfect all the way around, so we didn't need any seal material between our flange here and this flange. It looked like it burned perfectly. I don't see any air going through or coming in either way. So that can be a really good indicator on how well your seal works between your doors, the soot line against it. That's what that darker coloring is here, so I can rock my finger across it there for you. Anyways, so that's just quarter inch flange over the top of an eighth inch solid plate, and I put two of those on there. So later on, we can incorporate a viewing window into the faces of these, so we can see what's going on inside of this chamber, because when you open the door, you'll break the entire thermal draw cycle that's taking place inside of here. So right here, the inner flange is another piece of that quarter inch all the way across right there. That gives us a nice seal on our door. So I want to show you here on the door exactly how these little latches work. So you can see the handle on the outside. You can see it's a elongated chunk. Nice block piece of steel I welded onto a rod. Going through a rod guide here, we have springs on these with our handles. And what this allows it to do is be spring loaded and they're pretty difficult to move. And this gives us a pressure relief valve door. So it's not only our door, but because both the upper and lower uh, latches here are spring loaded, that gives us a pressure relief if this thing ever back blasts. And that's a big enough pressure relief valve that shouldn't ever take out the barrel and just blow open the door on us. And so when you get it shut like this, you turn the handles, you push them in just a little bit under the spring tension and turn them. Once again, you gotta push it in just to get it behind the lip. And there you go, I'll turn it sideways for you. There's the two door handles installed. Now it's a nice good seal. We just burnt to test it all out. All right, so simple hinges, everything like that. I've just got a, a welded pin hinge here on some quarter inch plate. Down here, I've got a pull pin, so I can actually pull this pin out, lift the whole door off of this if I ever choose to. Very simple design. Now I showed you down when we were constructing this, the inner barrel has the dump bottom on it. And that dump bottom dumps here into this drawer. And what this is, a stainless plate all the way around, an inner and outer layer, so I've got a drawer here that pulls out and that's our ash drawer. And the air intake for this whole system is right here. So you just bend this little lever, it moves a hinge. Let's see if I can get a good angle for you on that. It moves that hinge and opens up that entire plate there. 
and that's our air inlet to this stove. Now when you want to fire it up nice and hot and fast, you can actually just open the entire drawer up. Say you open it up this far and that's full air draw up underneath the system. So the air has to draw in through this, get evenly kind of dispersed in the center of this barrel and then go all the way around the rim evenly. Because if you only have air draw on one side, it's going to create the jets up top inside of your stove up here are going to be unevenly powered. The air is going to take the path of least resistance obviously and not want to travel all the way around the barrel. So you're going to want to make sure your air draw is evenly kind of dispersed in the center underneath the entire system if you want it to work evenly around the top up there. So anyways, you can shut the drawer down once you've got it lit up and then here's your air regulator there. Nice simple, you got a handle on the, the end of it here, you pull it all the way out. So there's our actual ash dump drawer, it's a nice heavy duty drawer. You can see here I built an outer box to hold all that. Let me see if I can get the camera angle underneath there, see if you can get some kind of zoom to happen. So you can kind of see pieces there of the dump right there, the hinge dump piece up underneath. So there's your air draws, that big open square that I cut inside, as you can see here, the lights are hurting it there, but that's actually the lid of a barrel turned upside down down there. So we can take this whole bottom section off by removing this ring around the lid of the barrel. So this was a barrel upside down. I put the lid on it, made this nice square box all the way around. And once again, from this angle, you can see I've welded after cutting the square in the lid, welded that to us. It's a nice seal all the way around our ash dump box. And that makes it nice and safe. It makes it sealed so that the air draw is nice and regulated. Now that I've showed you the front drawer, let me walk you around here and show you what actuates the dump bottom that I built on the inner burn chamber that I showed you earlier. I showed you the, the lever on that and the pivots and everything and how it's sealed. So here's the top of our handle that will actuate this. And it's got a little bent tang here that kind of acts as a retainer spring to the handle. So you come up here, you just bend it past the retainer spring. And now what it is is a double counter lever. So when it comes down and out like this, it holds the bottom dump door all the way open. And to shut it, you bring it past the counter lever and you push it in. Once again, you just bring the top up here so you can see what I'm doing. Bring the top past that little tang there. And it's going to hold that dump door nice and shut right now. So once again, to actuate it, and give you a little bit of a different angle. It's going to be harder for me to actuate it at the angle, but there you go. There's a double counter lever and that gives it a nice push against it to keep it open. It also, on the return, gives a really nice angle to push down with some pressure to close that dump door. So there you go, once again, like that is open and that is closed. And you just push it up into the top and bam, it's gonna hold itself there. Right now I'm standing on top of a ladder and I wanted to show you how this afterburner chimney pipe is working. And we're gonna cut this off after we're done with the show for this. And we're gonna install a real chimney pipe out into our secondary barrel like I explained earlier. But for the show, I want to demonstrate just how much fuel is being released, even though it's filling this and burning this super hot. What I've got here is a 10 inch piece of iron pipe all the way up. See if I can get you the angle there. That's a 10 inch piece. Inside of that, as you can see down here, at the tip of my finger, is an 8 inch piece of pipe going all the way up. And this is our outer sleeve. And you notice I've got these square stock spacers here. And that's giving us an air draw into the gap between the inner and outer sleeve right here. So this is our air draw in. This will pull in our fresh air mixture that will help cool and mix in with the gas as it travels all the way to the top. Let me go ahead now and climb to the top of this and show you what it looks like from the inside. I'm standing on top of the ladder at the very top of our gasifier chimney pipe here, the afterburner. This is the 8 inch output right here. Here's a flange that actually seals off the 8 inch between the 10 inch and the 8 inch at the top. Making sure the air being drawn up has to go into the internal pipe and doesn't just rush up out the top here between the two pipes. So that's all that flange at the top is doing. If I go ahead now and peek inside, you can see this like ring. Let me go ahead and try to get the focus right. Right at the tip of my finger here, this is a slice running all the way around. You can see a weld point there. There's a weld point over here at the tip of my finger. You can see my finger there. Another one back towards us. So three point weld with a gap about a quarter inch between rings of pipe. And I've got three of those gaps. So that's our top injection point for the air rushing between the two pipes. We'll inject into that top slice right there into our internal pipe, mixing at the very final point and give us our jet flare out the top here. I've got one more slice. Uh, let's see, about right in here somewhere. 
another one of those, and then way down here I have another one. So we have three air injection points between the two sleeves here, and that should give us just the right amount of volume of air mixture to the actual volume of gas that we're producing and give us a pretty good jet off from this. So we're gonna fire this up tonight, and I'll show you exactly what it looks like. It's nighttime, we've got the headlights on, we filled this thing full of wood, and we're gonna fire it up. We've got a nice clear area, no power lines above us, nothing like that. I've got it now filled with normal firewood, like this stuff right here that you see all the way down in our lower chamber. We've got a pile of kindling and some sawdust. Let me get out of the headlights here. We've got that at the top. We're going to light it unlike a normal fire, which typically light at the bottom of the wood mass. Once again, you're going to light this fire at the top of the wood mass. It's going to burn its way down, producing the wood gas inside of the stove. So what we're going to do now is we're going to fire this up. We're going to go ahead and let it kind of get up to temperature. And I'll show you what it looks like when it's fully in action with the headlights off. So I just want to show you here just exactly what this looks like as it's firing up. So you can see how big the flame is right now, how much sparks it's casting due to those sawdust chips we started it with. I'm going to let it fully get up to temperature. And hopefully those flame that's jetting out of there, it's going to look a lot like those sparks you see in height. Okay. All right, folks, so here we are. You can see the stove on the sides red hot. You can see this flame. See the sheer volume of fuel that's being consumed inside of the stove. If I can get close enough to get the zoom to focus in here without kind of fuzzing out, maybe I can show you how well that ring inside of there is working. You can see the sheer volume, the wall of fire that's taking place right there. It's an incredible release of energy, folks. shooting out of the top of that stove that thing's got to be a good three foot maybe whipping up to almost a four foot flame right now that's a lot of extra energy coming out of there we're going to go ahead and turn on the headlights so you can see what this looks like in the light but i thought i'd go ahead and show you this in the dark that's just an immense amount of feel let me walk up to it so you can get a better idea of what that looks like coming out of the top i'm right below it there it doesn't look as tall now if i back up here you can definitely get an idea of just how big that really is so let's go ahead and turn on the lights and I'll show you it. There you go, folks. So there you go. That's the extra fuel being produced inside of the stove that we're now going to pump out of a couple 90s out of the top of the stove to two barrels right beside it. Let me get my shadow out of there. Two barrels sitting right beside this will actually be where that fire is taking place. Hope you enjoyed. Until next time, this is Mr. Teslonian. Hi folks, Mr. Teslonian back here again. Today what we're going to do is make a wood-powered chainsaw. So there's the chainsaw we're going to use. It's an older McCulloch or something like that. Pretty heavy duty. Those older saws are built pretty strong. We're also going to use this right here, which is an old propane style heater from a camper. And what we're going to do is start cutting this whole thing apart. The only part of this I really want is this case right here and these two sets of tubes. And before I start cutting it, I just wanted to show you what it originally started out looking like. You see the propane inputs here, you got your pilot light, all the rest of it. I'm going to take a sawzall, I'm going to sawzall these off because they are tack welded on, so to get this out of there, I'm going to have to cut it. I'm going to have to sawzall right here, I'm going to pull the tank out, and I'll show you what it looks like from there. Alright, so I've got this gasifier powered chainsaw now complete, I'm just going to walk around real quick, kind of in a big broad circle, kind of show it to you from all these angles, show you what it looks like. That's the entire system sitting on an aluminum plate. Uh, that nice shiny plate you see right here, that's our bellow system. It's a big bellow, it's kind of collapsed right now. That allows us to get the gasifier up into temperature very, very fast. That was a friend of mine's idea to bring that up. He thought about a bee smoker, so I've added a bellow to it, and I'll show you that a little closer here in a moment. So you can see all the little parts and pieces here. I've added a fire extinguisher to it there. Underneath this is a radiator system to a propane-powered RV refrigerator, which I'll show you here in a moment when I flip it upside down. Let me go ahead and finish the walk around. All right, so now let's just start out with the basics here. We've got our chainsaw sitting mounted to the system. There's two main bolts holding the chainsaw on there. The balance point with the old handle that used to come up right here, you can see it in the original shots of this, the balance point was no longer going to work. So I had to build my own handle and offset the balance point on this just a little more over. That way when you hold the saw, it stays nice and centered. It was tipping too much with the original balance points. So I had to redo all that. Here's our gas output from the gasifier, which is this. That was that RV style propane heater that I pulled out. I showed you that originally. That's our gas output line. 
it runs down in here. When I pull the chainsaw off in a minute here, you'll be able to see all this a lot better. But that is the refrigerator cooling system from that RV refrigerator. You can see the lines running back and forth in there. I measured it out. There's about 12 foot of tubing inside of that entire system. That's quite a bit of tubing to help cool this. So the ash catch, so the gas comes down this. This is kind of a primary uh, resin or oil catch and an ash catch right here. Goes into the tank before going into the smaller lines. That way we don't plug that line. And I'll show you there's an output over here on the side that we can dump it all out from that side and clean that thing out. So let's go on to the gasifier real quick here. You can see I've got a nice T-handle on the top of it. I made these like T-bolts to help untwist those wing nuts that were originally on it. And I'll take one of these off real quick just to show you. It's kind of a wing nut welded on there. That makes it nice and easy to get to when you're trying to move this thing around or open it up to feed it. So let's move around this thing, keep showing you what we got. This is our chimney pipe coming out of the gasifier. And let me go down here, so that top tube coming out of the propane heater here was where I welded the uh, actual chimney pipe, and that helps keep the draw running. You're going to need some kind of chimney pipe to get the draw running right to get this up to gasifier temperature. Uh, down here you can see the bellow injection system has an air gap, so that way when you're not pumping the bellow, air can still draw into the bottom. That's your air feed in. But if you notice right in here, let me zoom in for you. That's the pipe that comes out of the bellow, delivering a pressurized air burst through this. It captures a little more air through the venturi that goes on and grabs a bunch of volume, throws it through the gasifier, and we get a nice high temperature in there. And when you're using the bellow, the chimney pipe is going to be open. Right now you can see the top lid to the chimney pipe is closed. And what you do is you kind of pull this back, you set it off of there, and to start it up, you'll open up the lid there to the chimney pipe and that'll give you your flow dynamics that you need to get this up to temperature. All right, so now we're looking at the bellows system that I put together. Let me go ahead and unhook this. There we go. That comes right off of there, and you open up the bellows system. You can see how nice that is. Uh, back here, I'm gonna actuate it in a moment. Back here is our quick release for the bellow. The bellow is not always needing to be attached to this. It's just something you attach while you get it started. You're going to pop this. Let me set up the camera. It's going to take two hands to work this thing off of there, right? Let me set up the camera so I can show you how it comes off. All right, so I'm going to pop that latch I showed you. You can see up at the top of the screen right there. It's going to take a little bit of pressure, but you just wiggle this thing back and forth, just like that, and it pops right off of there. So there's your bellow. Nicely detached from the rest of the system. You can see here how it clamps on. You can see some of the air hole draw around there. The actual air input into the system. And it's got the air draw into the bellow right here. All right, just to put it back on real quick for you, you're gonna start out with the top one. Just gonna align the rod a little bit there. Go down to the bottom one. Get that aligned. And just kind of push it on, just like that. And lock the lock. And now to actuate the bellow, you're going to go like this, and that gives a lot of airflow into that gasifier and get it started really fast and up to temperature. And once again, when it's actually lit, you're just going to pop the latch, pull the thing right back off of there just like that, set that aside, and now there's your chainsaw ready to go. Once I get this thing running, I want to see if I can mix the air right here. This will give a lot more time between the air mixing into the wood gas and getting to the actual carburetor over here. Kind of give that mix a little bit more time to cool and mix properly. Uh, if not, we're gonna run it from this valve over here, which I'll show you. But anyway, so there's also a drain valve, so you can drain any liquids or anything that I've collected inside of this. Now this fire extinguisher is also a filter system. All right, so inside of this, I have a rod hooked up to a bolt on the bottom side of the fire extinguisher top. I've got kind of a curly Q hook here, so you wrap the material around a few times, that way it doesn't come untouched. And inside of this is a big length of cotton t-shirt that you can pull out of there. Uh, that fills kind of a nice filtering system at the very end here. You can remove the filter, pull it out and exchange that, and you push it back in there. I'm going to leave that out for the rest here. It'll take me a moment to get that in there, so we'll kind of let that hang. But there's a secondary, or the last final filter before it goes into the engine. Out of the top of the fire extinguisher, your gas pipe comes out here, travels down. Let me undo the cap here, so you can see where it goes into the carburetor. And I've cut out the cap so you can allow for the piping to go through and still use the original cap. From this angle, you should be able to look down and see the plate that mounts up to the carburetor there. I still need to clean all the welding BBs off of that, obviously. Uh, but that's where the wood gas itself, with the fresh air mixed in with it, goes into the carburetor. And I had to modify a couple pieces here just to make it so the trigger still went to this butterfly valve that actually delivers more or less fuel to the engine. Uh, that's going to probably work just fine. It's not a needle valve. It's actually a nice butterfly valve in there. Uh, that should work. I don't have to modify this carburetor. The air-to-fuel mixture right here, this is where you'll 
add fresh air into the gas and get the air to fuel mixture right. And you'll regulate how much fuel is actually making it into the engine from right here through your trigger. Uh, this should work great. I don't like how short of a time frame the gas and the fresh air have to mix together right here. It's going to work fine for starting it up. But like I said earlier, the valve at the bottom of the fire extinguisher may actually work a lot better to give a little more time, a little more cooling to everything. Let me go ahead now and pull the top off our gasifier. And I already pulled one of these wing nut pieces off of here. Let me go ahead and just finish off the last one over here. All right, so there's our double wing nuts. We've got a T handle here so we can pull this off. There's our lid. You can see here, this is the gas output into the engine coming out there. I've got a screen around the tip of it, kind of a cone screen. That helps keep the material from getting in there. Uh, we've got a flat plate in the bottom, which has air holes all the way around the flat plate, not through the center. We're going to throw the material on top of that. That flat plate right there is sitting right about where my thumb tip is on this line, which is above our air input right here. So this is our air input, comes in below that flat plate. The air has to go around those side grooves and into the wood mass. And because there's no air here at the top being introduced into the system, that's gonna make a good wood gas production at the top. We're gonna draw that wood gas off without any oxygen added, cool it through the system there, back up, filter it, and into the uh, carburetor. Pretty simple wood gas design. I actually didn't alter this at all. That was the plate that was in it. I just flipped it upside down. That would have typically been the bottom of the unit. So that's all I did here. This should work fine. You could put some screen in there to keep small chunks from falling down. But those actual small chunks work pretty good to keep the fire going inside of the bottom of it. Underneath the chainsaw, you see this metal plating. It goes all the way around the entire thing. And that's around the coils down here. And maybe through there, if I zoom in, you can see some light coming in. You can see the screen down through the coils down there that's letting the air come up. And also, down here at the bottom, I've got an air gap right there between these legs that are holding it up off the bottom so fresh air can draw underneath right there. And that is going to allow it to create kind of like a fan shroud around this, creating a higher draw density around those coils based not only on the heat in the coils, the gasifier heat and the chainsaw heat up above it, all that heat rising off of everything is going to create kind of a draw through this whole system. So I've got the two main screws that hold the chainsaw to this unit. They're undone, they're pulled out of there. I'm going to go ahead now and just remove the chainsaw from it for a moment right there in front of you so you can see this. It takes a little bit of maneuvering. But we can get it out of there pretty easy. Just about like that. And wham. Now we've got our chainsaw. All right, now that I've got that out of there, one of the things that could be done with this, and I'm going to show you here when we go to run it, hopefully I can find some hose by then, is you're going to be able to run a hose from this system back here, either from right here or underneath, out to the chainsaw. So you don't have to pack this whole thing around on the chainsaw. You can use it either attached, which it's designed for, or the way it detaches like this and still leaves one of the parts here on the chainsaw, you can run a hose between the two of them, set the bottom of this where the radiator is, down in the snow, just like you see around me right now, or you could set that down in a creek or a mud puddle or something like that to cool it, giving you kind of a better cooling efficiency and a lot less weight, obviously, on the chainsaw. Now that we've got the chainsaw out of there, you can see what's going on behind it a lot clearer and what's going on underneath it. See, it just got a brace bar up top here, the chainsaw rests on, a couple mount points there and there. Uh, we got this radiator cooling system that came from an old refrigerator unit, a RV style propane refrigerator unit that's sitting down in there. You see all the mount points here, you can see how it rests in between. Let me go ahead and now flip it up right. You can see the bottom of it, the protector screen here allows the airflow through. But when you set it down, obviously you can't just dent those coils underneath there, which you can't get the dents out of coils, it's very, very difficult. Uh, you got the legs here, let me give you some perspective. So there you go folks, that's what it looks like, separated from the chainsaw, and like I said, you could run a hose from one to the other. What you see over here at the top is that output or input to the uh, carburetor pipe still remaining on the chainsaw. You'd put one end of your gas line onto that, run that extended gas line all the way over to the output here, and you can regulate your flow. You're going to want a ball valve right off the side right here, that way you can regulate the fuel to air mixture right at the chainsaw. And this way you don't have to pack the whole thing around like well, I folks, said. I hope you enjoyed the build video on how to build your own wood powered chainsaw. We're going to do a separate video for the fire up and running of this. We're going to have some logs set out so that way you can buzz through some logs with it, show you how well it works. All right, folks, what we're going to do today is fire up our gasifier powered chainsaw here. I'm going to walk you around to show you how to fire this thing up. First of all, I took a doweling rod, cut it up into a bunch of little chunks here. That's the wood we're going to use. I've got some newspaper and some sawdust from cutting up the doweling rods in the bottom of the thing here. What I'm going to do now is go ahead and just put all this down inside of there. Take me a moment here. 
Well, now that I got this thing full all the way to the top, you can see here, it's right up to the surface here. We're gonna stick the lid on there. I'm gonna pull the bellow real quick, set up the camera, and stick some newspaper inside of there. We're gonna light this thing up and see if we can't run our chainsaw on it. So let me go ahead and set up the camera. Okay, so we got it full of wood. We got our chimney pipe open. I've stuck some newspaper shreds down in here. Let's go ahead and light these up. Usually it draws pretty good, so let's see how well this lights. Stick the camera down in there so you can kind of watch the draw effect. Might have stuffed a little bit too much down in there. We'll see how well this works. All right, looks like it's gonna light, folks. All right, so I've been pumping on this thing here for a moment. We're actually starting to get a pretty good amount of smoke coming out of that chimney. Let's make sure it gets all the way up to wood gas temp here. All right, let's try to light that now. There we go. Look at that, folks. Can you see the fire? Let me back up the camera and make sure you can see that. So what I've done here is backed up the camera just a little bit so you can see this better when I ignite the wood gas coming out of this. And when I go to shut this, I'm going to have to do it all pretty quick. So here, let's stop pumping. Let's hit it with the lighter. Look at that, folks. That's an incredible output gas. So we're definitely hitting wood gas. That's a great demonstration that you're achieving wood gas. Let's give it a few more pumps. So we're ready. Now that you see that, we're ready to shut this thing down. I'm going to move the camera over so you can see what I'm doing to pull start it. Let's do one more flare off, make sure we're there. Oh yeah, we've got great wood gas production, folks. Hopefully you can see how tall that flame is in the, the video camera there. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and move the camera, shut this down. We're ready to go. Okay, so now that we got the smoke going, let me go back over here, set down the camera, and see if we can't fire this thing up. We're over here, folks. We're going to try to get this thing to start. I'm going to try to get the gas all the way through the engine with the valve back here all the way closed. I might have shut it down there. Let's try it again. And it's difficult with these bigger ball valves to get that air fuel mixture right because it's just such a big area. And it's a small amount of adjustment.
can give it one more little shot. I got two stroke oil. Just like that. I have this thing running now for a while. I can keep it idling like this. The second I give it any gas, it'll rev up for a while, but then it just chokes itself off and dies. So I was wrong. This carburetor isn't going to work for wood gas. The same obstacle I come to every time I try to run an engine on wood gas. The carburetor's the liquid fuel. It's just not designed for it. And all you can achieve is a little bit of higher than idle. So I'm going to take that off. So there you go, it chokes itself down folks. Until next time, I hope you enjoyed. This is Mr. Teslonian.